This video is a free CCMP advanced routing lesson. This lesson is part two of the RPV4 and RPV6 addressing and routing. In this session, we will focus on RPV6 addressing and how RPV6 addresses are configured. So we start with EUI64, then we will look at RPV6 Slack and then DHCPv6, stateful and stateless. And finally, we will look at the RPV6 forwarding. Let's get to it. As in RPv4, RPv6 addresses can be unicast, multicast, or any cast. For unicast, you will find your global unicast, and these will be recognized by the 2001 they start with. You will also find the link local addresses starting by FE80. Now, the link local addresses are not routable. They are used to communicate between hosts or devices connected to the same link. And then you have your loopback addresses. So similar to the slash 32 for IPv4, these are slash 128. Multicast addresses will be recognized by FF00. And as a side note, your default route will be double column slash zero. So this is equivalent to your RPV4 default route, which is 0, .0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0 slash zero. RPV4 addresses are 32 bits and made up network prefix and a host. For RPV6, we have a prefix or subnet ID. So this is equivalent to your network prefix. And then we have the interface or the host ID. RPV6 addresses are 128 bits. This is an example of how an RPV6 address will look like. It is made up eight blocks of 16 bits each and written in hexadecimals. This address can be, for example, subnetted as a slash 32, which means that the first two blocks, eight bits each, is your prefix ID and the remaining bits are the, your host or interface ID. This is how a slash 48 would look like. The first three blocks would be your subnet ID. And finally, a slash 64, where half of the RP address is a prefix ID and the remaining half is a host or interface ID. A slash 64 is the one commonly used as a host RP address as we will see in the next examples. There are rules to simplify a long IPv6 address such as this one. And for example, the first one would be that the leading zeros can be dropped. So for example, if you see the marked zeros here, they can all be taken out. So you will end up with this representation. Note that I have not touched this zeros and they could technically be replaced by one zero each. But there is another rule we will take advantage of, which is a sequence of zeros can be replaced by double column. So this will be the end result, replacing this three blocks of zeros by a double column. Note that this can only be done once. RPv6 addresses can be assigned manually, just like in RPv4. However, there are ways to assign RPv6 automatically. Let's start with EUI64. So in this example, I have a host PC1 with a MAC address 5254001B 161A connected to a router. Host PC1 will be a slash 64, meaning 64 bits for the prefix ID and 64 for the interface or host ID. With EUI64, the host will assign its own host ID based on IEEE EUI64 standard. In this process, the host will use its own MAC address, which is 48 bits, and converts it to a 64 bits host ID. So how would this work? How do we go from 48 bits MAC address to a 64 bits host ID? Starting with the MAC address of PC1, the MAC address is split in two halves, right in the middle. FFFE is inserted 
So at this point, we have gone from 48 bits to 64 bits. And the last step is that the seventh bit is flipped. So in our case, two has become zero. Let's look in depth at this last step. Starting with 5.2 written in binaries, you can see that the number one in red is the seventh bit. So that is flipped and becomes zero, which will end up giving us five zero. And finally, the prefix ID used here in the case of EUI64 is FE80 for link local address. So this will lead to the RPv6 address of FE80 double column and then the modified MAC address using EOI64. Now let's look at how it works in a lab environment. I have my PC1 on the left side directly connected to router one. The hosts are typically already configured to use EOI64. If I look at my configuration, running IFI config or if interface config on PC1, I can see the MAC address in blue and I can see how that translates into an IPv6 address starting by FE80 for the link local. I can see the 5054, which is essentially 5254 from the MAC address where the seventh bit has been flipped. I can see the FFFE in red and then the rest of the MAC address. So in effect, PC1 has configured its own IPv6 address using EUI64. In the case of routers, the interface must first be enabled for IPv6. So looking at R1, I started by doing a show IPv6 interface brief. And as you can see, there is no IPv6 address under gigabit 00. The next thing I do is I verify the MAC address for router 1 on gigabit 00. And then the next step is I configure or I enable RPv6 under gigabit 00. So RPv6 enable is the command for Cisco routers. And as a validation after that, I run my show RPv6 interface brief for the second time. Here I can see that an RPv6 has been generated using EOI64. Once again, you see that it starts with FE80 for link local. And then you see the MAC address split in the middle by FFFE and the seven bit flipped. Another way to configure RPv6 addresses is to use Slack. So Slack stands for stateless address auto configuration. And Slack is very similar to EOI64. In fact, EOI64 will be used in this case. But in addition to having an RPv6 address, the router will also configure a default gateway. So let's see how it works. First, when router2 R2 boots up, it will send a router solicitation message, RS, to discover routers on a local link. These have to be RPv6 router on local link, as we will see later in a Wireshark capture. When receiving the root solicitation message, R1 responds with a router advertisement. R2 will then use the information in the router advertisement and the EUI64 to generate its host ID and then the link local address of R1 as a default gateway. Looking at a packet capture for traffic between R1 and R2 seen from R2's perspective, we first start by seeing the router solicitation message sent by R2. The source address is the link local address of router2 and the destination is FF02 double column 2. Now, this address is the multicast for all RPv6 routers. And it has a MAC address associated with it that is 33330000 colon 2. Now, looking at the reply from router 1, which is the router advertisement, we see that the source address is the link local address which is the interface on router 1. And essentially, this will become the default gateway for R2. The destination used here is FF02 double column 1, which is the all RPv6 devices multicast address with the associated MAC address. And under the RCMP v6 option, you can see that the prefix information is inserted. 
So this is the IP address, the RPv6 address configured on R1 interface facing R2. So at this point, R2 has a prefix information or prefix ID. So using its MAC address, it can generate its own RPv6 address. And it also has a default gateway, which is the link local address of R1. In terms of configurations, this is how we will look. So for R1 to start sending or responding with router advertisement, it has to become an IPv6 router first. So IPv6 routing must be enabled. And this is exactly what I've done in my configuration of R1. Under interface gigabit01 for R1, I have enabled an IP address where the host ID is one. This is a slash 64 IPv6 address. On R2, under interface gigabit01, I enable Slack and the configuration is IPv6 address autoconfig. So this two configurations, both on R1 and R2, should be enough for R2 to generate its own IPv6 address and a default gateway. Going back to R2, I'll do show IPv6 interface brief. And I can see that gigabit01 has indeed created or generated an IPv6 address using the prefix ID that was sent on the router advertisement from R1. When I do show IPv6 route, I can see that there is a default route. So that's the double column forward slash zero. And the next hop is a link local address that I recognized from the FEAT, which is router one gigabit zero one link local address. As a reminder, the default route for IPv6 is double column forward slash zero. Another validation on R2, if I do show IPv6 interface gigabit zero one, I can see that the stateless address autoconfig is enabled. So that's my Slack is enabled. I can see the global unicast address starting with 2001 and using the MAC address of R2 gigabit zero one. And I can also see at the end that the default router is root one link local address on gigabit zero one. The next section is stateful DHCPv6. For stateful DHCPv6, RPv6 addresses are assigned by a DHCPv6 server. In our example here, router R1 is acting as a DHCP server and R2 is our client. So in terms of configuration on R1, if you want to test DHCP server on a Cisco router, the first thing is to enable RPv6 unicast routing. And then you define your RPv6 DHCP pool, which is very similar to how it is done on IPv4 and how we have covered it in part one of this lesson. So here I enable the IPv6 DHCP pool where I set the address prefix. And then I'm setting a domain name here. You can add all the parameters such as DNS, for example. And then the last step is under the interface gigabit01. So it has to be the interface that is directly connected to the client. I will enable the RPv6 address using the same prefix ID as in my pool. And in this case, my host ID is one. And then I attach my DHCP pool under the interface. So the configuration is RPv6 DHCP server and then the pool name. On R2, to enable the interface as a DHCP client, I will simply add under the gigabit01 interface, RPv6 address DHCP. If you watch the first part of this where I cover IPv4 DHCP, you will see that the configuration for v4 is very similar. Is RP address DHCP. So once the DHCP v6 process is finished, I'm checking my R1 as a server to check the bindings. And I can see that the address or one address has been leased to router two. And then I go back to R2 to check whether I have indeed received the RPv6 address. And is it the same as the one showing in the DHCP binding on R1 running show RPv6 interface brief? I can see that it is exactly the same address that was leased by my DHCP server R1. In addition to that, doing a show run pipe IP domain, include IP domain, I can see that IP domain list networkslearning.com has also been 
added by the DHCP server. In terms of stateful DHCP v6 process, we've got four messages essentially. The client boots up and sends a solicit message to locate a DHCP server, as seen in the first line. The DHCP responds with an advertised message to indicate it is available and also send the information to the client. Here, if I drill down to the, the advertised message, I first see that the message type is advertise, and then I can see the RPv6 address that has been leased from the DHCP server R1 to the client R2. And I can also see the domain name networkslearning.com. Once this is received by the client, the client sends a formal request for the IPv6 configuration parameters. And then the server replies with a reply message confirming the configuration parameters. So again, this is very similar to the discovery offer request ACK as we have seen in the previous part for IPv4 DHCP. The first message, the solicit message sent by the client is using a destination FF02 double column one column two, which is multicast address for all IPv6 DHCP agents. In this section, we will look at stateless DHCPv6. Stateless DHCPv6 combine both Slack and DHCPv6. So the router sends or hosts booting up will send as normal its router solicitation message to discover routers on the local link. Router R1 will respond with a router advertisement as we have seen earlier for Slack. So in this router advertisement, you will have a subnet prefix and a gateway, which is enough information for R2 to generate its RPv6 address and to have a default gateway. In addition to that, in this message from R1, router 2 or host 2 will also receive a DHCP v6 server information for any remaining parameters that host R2 may need. So in the first instance, R2 will use this information received from router 1 to generate a subnet ID and host ID. And then it will find the DHCP v6 server as we have seen in the DHCP or stateful DHCP v6 and obtains the remaining information. Let's look at a concrete example from my lab. Here, R1 acts as an RPv6 router, as well as a DHCPv6 server. So for the DHCPv6 part, I will configure my pool as I did earlier for the stateful DHCPv6 server. But in this case, if you notice, I'm not configuring an RPv6 prefix. So the DHCP server here will not be assigning an RP address. What it will be assigning though is a DNS server address and a new domain name. Under gigabit01 for R1, I will add the DHCP v6 configuration. As you can see, I've got RPv6 DHCP server and then the pool name, but the new configuration has to be added and that's the other config flag. So what this does, it tells R2 to look for a DHCP v6 server. On R2 under gigabit 01, I'll configure RPv6 address autoconfig. If you remember from the previous slides, this is the configuration necessary for Slack. To validate the results, I'll run a show RPv6 interface brief, and I can see that gigabit 01 on R2 has indeed generated its RPv6 address. And from the log, I can see that the information from the DHCP server have also been received. So I can see that the DNS server is set as well as a domain name. Going back to R1, if you do show RPv6 interface gigabit 01, you could see at the bottom part of the output that hosts are using stateless auto configuration for addresses and hosts are using DHCP to obtain auto configuration. So this is a validation that 
we are looking at stateless DHCP v6. In the last section, we're going to look at RPv6 forwarding. In this example, I have an RPv6 network with two PCs on the same LAN and a remote server separated by router R1. Router 1 interface on the LAN is dot one dot 10 is assigned to pc1 and dot 20 to pc2 so in this case what happens when pc1 wants to reach pc2 in an ipv6 setup this is very similar to what we have seen in part one when we looked at rpv4 rp forwarding pc1 will establish whether the dot 20 the address of pc2 is on the same subnet if it is on the same subnet the frames will be sent directly to PC2, else the frame will be sent to the default gateway. The next step, does PC1 have a MAC address associated with a dot .20? So PC1 will reference its cache to see if there's a mapping RPv6 address, MAC address. PC1 has to look up for this mapping if it doesn't have it. So PC1 has to look for PC2 MAC address associated with the dot .20. So the layer three frame can be encapsulated in the layer two frame containing the destination MAC address. In our case, PC2 will respond with its MAC address and PC1 encapsulate the layer through packets and send the frame to PC2. So this is exactly as it works for RPv4 to a certain extent. The challenge in this case is that there is no broadcast in RPv6 which means there is no ARP, as is the case for IPv4. RPv6 does not use ARP, but instead relies on RPv6 address resolution. So in this section, we will see how the RPv6 resolution works. We have a PC1 connected, directly connected to router 1. And if R1, router 1, needs PC1's MAC address, it will search its neighbor table which is the cache where the association IPv6 address, MAC address are listed. Let's assume R1 does not have this entry. So R1 sends a neighbor solicitation message to PC1 asking for a MAC address. PC1 will respond with a neighbor advertisement message sharing its MAC address. These messages neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement are RCMPv6 messages. The neighbor solicitation messages are multicast, whereas the neighbor advertisements are unicast. Let's take a look at a packet capture for the communication between R1 and PC1. So we start with the neighbor solicitation message from R1 And you can see the neighbor advertisement from PC1. The source address of the solicitation message is the router's interface and the destination address is a multicast address, as we have just covered. And this address is associated to the multicast MAC address 33 column 33 column FF column 00010. Now looking at the neighbor advertisement message, You can see that the source is the RP address of PC1. The message type is neighbor advertisement. And here you can see the source address and the destination address. So both these two are unicast as we have covered earlier. And you can see the MAC address of router one, R1, as well as the source MAC address of the PC. With this information, you can create that binding as we did have in ARP for IPv4, which is the mapping between MAC address and IPv6 address. This brings us to the end of this session. I hope you have found it useful and learned a few things about IPv6 addressing. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the section below. Thank you for watching.